everyone. Thank you for those of you who are not leaving to go take an early lunch. No, just kidding, I love you too. Um, I'm Christopher, I work on Anoma. Um, and it's, yeah, the talk is very opportunely timed. I guess what I'm talking about here, just to situate it a little bit, also public safety advisory, I wrote these slides at like five in the morning. I was still kind of jet lagged, so they might not be pedagogically optimized. If you, you know, like the talk, but you think the slides are confusing, or you didn't like the talk because you thought the slides were confusing, in either case, feel free to come find me afterwards and complain about it. Um, so I, th I think it might be helpful just for this crowd here to situate Anoma in relation to, say, a project like Suave. Uh, I guess we kind of, you know, we envision our role in a broader ecosystem as sort of doing things which are complementary, like doing things maybe which other people aren't doing, based on what constraints, you know, we, we, we might have that are different. And in particular, one thing which is different about Anoma as compared to kind of projects in the Ethereum ecosystem is basically that we are willing to ditch backwards compatibility. As in that, like, you know, I've worked with Ethereum and I've worked with Cosmos and both of those systems are great and they're working in the real world and they have real users. And those things are amazing and I'm thrilled that people are building on those systems. Uh, on the other hand, I think those systems also embed a lot of design assumptions and many of them are kind of old. Like they're design assumptions that were made based on our understanding of the world, you know, five years ago. Um, and some of those assumptions I think have proved to be right and some of them I think have proved to be, you know, if not wrong, at least like kind of orthogonal to what has actually happened. So in that spirit, I'm going to explain a little bit about how taking this kind of intense, and so we, you know, Anoma has been working on this intense centric idea, often phrased in kind of vague terms for a little while, and now it's kind of permeated its way through all the layers of the protocol stack to what you might call a VM. And this talk is going to be about that. So to kind of relate it to the previous one, this is like a proposal for an intent language, or so to speak. And I'm not, you know, what is an intent? That's a great question. Maybe intents are decided based on extensional equality. There's just no one true answer. I'm not going to try and give a, you know, the one true holy answer to what is an intent. This is kind of our answer to how can intents be represented. And it's an answer that we think satisfies, you know, design criteria that many of these projects may actually share. Um, so we think it's, it's interesting to this audience. Uh, so this talk was inspired by basically a tweet and a meme. I would like to give credit. Uh, so the tweet, uh, thank you, Andrew Miller, who I, I haven't seen here, but maybe he will somehow see this later. Intents and transactions aren't really different. Let's fight. Uh, well, well, I mean, if you like squint really hard, intense transactions, there's like some data. You send it to the distributed system, like something happens. But I think I think that's like squinting slightly too hard. Um, and I'll get into why. Oh, you can't see this. Oops. Well, anyway. Um, oh no, that's not good. This one. Uh, thanks, Sheen from Flashbots, for this this meme. So. I don't even know what this meme is called, but Vlad, CT, 4357 crowd, Anoma, they have no idea. It has a higher order commit commitments with extensive literature defining its semantics. Well, well, you know, yes, no. So interestingly, the extensive literature is full filled with what are called fo folk theorems, i.e. I where people seem to all know something, but it took a while for someone to write it down. And I think intents are kind of, you know, in fact, they're kind of the same thing from the research literature, also have this folk, folk theorem property. You see stuff like account abstraction and these kind of uh, user gas payment systems kind of approaching the concept of an intent, but in this domain-specific way. So this talk is about a kind of general intent-centric VM. And let me clarify a little bit what I mean by VM, because that word is used to refer to many things which I think are not really in the same category. So uh, a long time ago, that people were building computers and they wanted those computers to execute programs. And those computers had hardware constraints. They had like a processing unit, they had some instructions that that processing unit could execute, they had you know, some kind of like various levels of memory at different speed to sort of durability trade-offs. They had registers in a stack, they had volatile memory, slightly less fast but volatile, and they had non-volatile storage. And they wanted to like run programs, I mean very reasonable, this is like 1960, no one's thinking about MEV. They wanted to execute programs sequentially. So, if you go on the Wikipedia page, it's where I got it from, I'm not going to make up my own diagram, and look at von Neumann architectures, you'll see something like this di diagram. And basically the distinction between control and arithmetic logic units doesn't matter anymore, but the same kind of, you know, there's a communication system between the CPU, it's executing instructions sequentially, um, and as a result you kind of run through your programs, accessing memory, input output when you need to, right? Uh, so bonus credit to anyone who knows where this screenshot is from. But the EVM is, in the grand von Neumann style, a von Neumann VM. 
Um, it has a program counter, it has an instruction set, it has different kind of layers of memory and storage, and it goes through and it runs programs sequentially. Great. Um, and um, I am going to talk about a VM which is designed to do something else. So it's not like, it's not really competing with the EVM, um, but it is uh, doing something which I think is perhaps more suitable to this intent-centric world. In particular, this VM is designed to match conditional commitments atomically. And commitments involve programs. So you might say, well, of course, you just need something that will execute programs. Why don't you just use a von Neumann VM? Um, and my answer is that, yes, you can do that. But it's like not quite the relevant problem. Because what you want to do in matching commitments is to execute several commitments atomically. And in an intent-centric world, as I'll kind of get to in more specificity later in the talk, you care about whether the result of executing those intents or those commitments is satisfactory to all involved parties. May maybe you care a little bit less about the specific path of execution you took to get there, right? So there's a slightly different design constraint. Uh, and the EVM also includes a few other things which are like not exactly von Neumann things. It includes message passing between programs. It includes like scheduling. Those are relevant, I think, and I will get to them later. Sometimes uh, something people bring up in sort of the broad discourse is like Turing completeness. Um, well, if you want something, why don't you just emulate it on this Turing complete VM, which we already have. So bonus credit number two, to anyone who knows where this is from, I think this is harder actually, but you definitely are an OG if you recognize this quote. Um, I'll tell you at the end of the talk. Um, and my answer is yes, you can emulate the thing which I'm talking about upon the EVM. I think that's great. But you know, the question I'm interested in is like, what does the execution environment look like for intents? And where, how you kind of emulate that is a sort of you know, interesting from a performance standpoint, but kind of separate question. Like you could also emulate it on some other you know, non-EVM von Neumann machine and nothing would change that much. So uh, I want to go just to kind of go back a little bit into the research literature, uh, just to add another answer to the question of what is an intent. Uh, this meme is my own. Unfortunately, you can't see the bottom, but it says intents are um, cybernetic commitments to the future human LLM synthesis, something like that. It doesn't matter because I'm not going to talk about that. I'm mostly going to talk about the third thing. So what are intents? Intents are just transactions. Intents are binding conditional, commi conditional commitments from 50-year-old game theory. Right. So here's the 50-year-old game theory. Um, the first kind of folk theorem to be written down by Friedman in 1971 was this uh, uh, equilibrium for super games. And super games, I'm, I'm very sad that that term has kind of gone out of fashion. I think it's a more fun term than like repeated games. Super games, who doesn't want to play the super game? It's like the infinite super game. Uh, anyway, the result established in this paper was just that repeated interaction can result in any feasible individually rational payoff. And then a bunch of recent work, I'm just going to cite one, there are like 15 papers that talk probably more, I just haven't read them, but that talk about different variants of uh, this idea is program equilibria. I think this paper is particularly clear, so I recommend it. And the idea of program equilibria is basically that you can achieve this same result. You can get any feasible individually rational payoff if you have users, instead of just taking actions themselves, use what are called commitment devices or use programs and commit themselves to a strategy. And because this, is, because this provides like a credible guarantee of how users will act, then you can do stuff like this in the prisoner's dilemma. If my program is the same as the other player's program, then cooperate, else defect. Seems like very straightforward, right? So program equilibria, I think, are you know, what you might call the closest like uh, a near-term or like relatively recent research basis for intents. And I think the research literature here, uh, at least like I'll talk in just a sec about what I think we need to change, but it describes the problem pretty well from a mathematical perspective in terms of what we want to get out of these systems and why it's interesting. So from that perspective, I want to ask the kind of like different direction of questions. So forget blockchains, like whatever. What if we just wanted to center around commitments and then we want to like settle them somewhere. You do need public knowledge to make it credible. Uh, let's just say commitments are functions. We publish them to a blockchain and the blockchain like calculates this equilibrium, um, uh, which is sort of individually rationable and feasible. Um, I argued that this runs into basically four challenges. So if you just try and take the research literature and implement it, um, I think you run into all of these challenges. Um, you know, I'm not, maybe there are three, not four. It's not an exact mathematical characterization. Some of them are kind of related to each other and depend on the particular language. But I want to go over each of these in turn. Uh, 
The first is sort of termination, the second is function introspection, the third is this difference between nominal and structural identities, and the fourth is unclear information flow. So, um, right, uh, termination fixed point finding. So if you use the kind of most powerful representation in the research literature, which gives you the best game theoretic results, um, you need to use higher order commitments, as in commitments which are dependent on other players' commitments. And you want eventually your execution to terminate, which basically means that you need to somehow, you know, if your commitments are dependent on what the other players do and what the other players do are dependent on what you're committing to do, uh, that system runs forever unless someone short circuits somehow. And I've seen kind of two approaches in the research literature to short circuiting. Um, one of them is to use randomness. So if you have kind of a shared randomness beacon, then you can say like, oh, well, you know, 1% of the time I'll just cooperate, else I'll like call the other function, and that function will call me, and I will call that other function until some randomness happens, and then we'll both cooperate, and then it will terminate, right? Um, so it gets you like basically the same results, modulo some epsilon. Um, but I think this is like a more serious implementation problem than it might appear to be for two reasons. One, randomness, although it's possible to get in these kind of distributed systems, you know, threshold VLS signatures or something, it adds an assumption, which like it seems like you maybe don't want unless you really absolutely need it. And there's this kind of annoying trade-off that you have to now run for a lot of time until your randomness causes the system to terminate. And when your execution is replicated, that seems like a very expensive thing to do. Um, another way to do this is that you can add a separate payoff, basically bribe someone um, uh, to, to make you terminate. Um, and that uh, also works, but I think it sort of creates kind of unnecessary enmity. Um, so program equilibria, and the reason I said these were kind of related is that program equilibria deals with this problem by like checking, by reading the source code for the other guy's program. So if we go back, do, 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 here. Okay, so in the program equilibria paper, they write the program like this. There's some very simple syntax, but this is just the example. If my program equals the other player program, then do cooperate, else do defect. Um, that's great. The problem is that this equal sign is like, open type theory research problem in the general case. Um, in particular, if you want to deal with sort of programmatic preferences, which are going to encode complex things and you care about like specific sort of structures of if you do this kind of thing, what does your um, counterpart do? Uh, you would need like full dependent types. Like you basically need to prove arbitrary properties of these the other functions to figure out what your fixed point is. Um, so this is, you know, seems very heavyweight. Of course, there are dependently typed languages, but <coughs> Ideally, we wouldn't need to embed dependent types as a design requirement for our intent-centric architecture. The third um, challenge is what I call, you know, I don't know if this is exactly the right term, but what I call nominal versus structural identity, which is that in these formalisms, uh, all of the players are known and they're numbered. So they're referred to each other like by index. And if you have a formalism, I think like the one from 2011, that uses commitment devices, these devices are referred to each other by index. So there's kind of a closed world model um, where you can say, oh, well, I care about like what this specific player does, and I know beforehand who all the players are. <coughs> I don't think this matches what we need in the kind of distributed, uh, typical distributed blockchain setting. In particular, we want, we're dealing with this open world where we don't necessarily know, I mean, we definitely don't know all the identities of the players, we don't want to know for privacy reasons, and the set is like very large. Um, and anyway, so we typically don't care because we want to be able to find counterparties on the basis of, you know, structural identity, like what capabilities they have, where something like owning a token is a capability, you know, some, maybe we're actually trying to use these systems to avoid war, and then we want like credible attestations that this party can actually take some action in the external world, something like this. Uh, so we need to change the kind of basis of identity from this literature to include all actions that matter in our, <coughs> in our context. In the, my sort of fourth, fourth thing that I think we need to change is, uh, you know, not precisely characterized, but typically these uh, constructions from the research literature require or, or rely on this like magic, logically centralized commitment executing computer. Um, and it needs to take all these commitments and like calculate the equilibrium somehow or run them all or do something fancy. And then it needs to, you know, reach the, uh, you know, output that state, right? This is fine. Uh, but unfortunately it requires this like single logical point and it's not, you know, it doesn't give you this kind of fine-grained information control. Like you might want to know things like, oh, I have a bunch of these commitments, 
and some of them are not codependent. So in fact, I can like deal with them separately. And this, uh, you know, this this framework doesn't natively give you a way to check that. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the kind of specific construction that we have in mind, which we call a resource logic. And the reason we ended up choosing this term is that there <coughs> seem to be a bunch of similarities to kind of distributed linear logic. We care about you know no, no double spends in the blockchain context. Um, and we like the idea of modeling everything as resources. And there's a really basic kind of trick that resource logic uses to solve or address several of these concerns. Um, and that trick is to uh, forget some information or to not care about some information. And that information is the path of execution. So in a typical kind of a commitment scheme, you have like commitments, you, you, d you sort of do one commitment, then you check the next commitment, then you check the next commitment. It's like executing small state transitions one at a time. Um, and if you look at this in kind of a branching flow, you know, maybe depending on what player one does, if player one is the red arrow, you go to S1 or S1 prime, then depending on what player two does, you go to S2, S2 prime A, S2 prime B, et cetera, until you reach some final terminating state. Um, and my argument is that we actually have this brilliant property which allows us to not need to do this, which is atomicity. And we can get this by changing the type slightly. So instead of having commitments be kind of higher order um, functions, we can instead just pretend that we already executed everything. We can say that commitments will take some final state, including some you know, specific strategies which are played by particular players, and commitments will say, yes, I'm okay with that, or no, I'm not. So still they're issued by particular parties who have the ability to authorize particular actions. Uh, you know, uh, this is like a very high level view. But um, if we do this, then we can not care about the path. <coughs> so a sort of um, way to, to bring this into a practical context is that the earlier talk talked a little bit about um, these different sort of intent centric vertical specialized systems like account abstraction or something like this. And one thing which these systems often differ in is like where the execution is specifically happening. So there's some, you know, still some ultimately some verification on chain, but sometimes some, you know, someone is executing to do a meta transaction, sometimes some searcher or some builder is executing, the execution is happening somewhere. And if we can architect our VM in a way which doesn't care about where the execution happens, as long as the final result is in line with everyone's preferences and still satisfies the kind of state transition constraints of the system, then we sort of generalize all of these cases, as in like people can choose a specific topology for where the specific components of execution will happen at runtime. And all that we need to check, you know, on the final blockchain that we've agreed to trust for sort of, uh, you know, consensus and state custody purposes is that um, you know, everyone is happy, everyone who took an action in this transaction is happy with the final outcome. So how do we encode this? Um, in Anoma, we encode this in something uh, that we call resources. And resources are, uh, you know, they're, they're like a little bit like smart contracts, but not quite. Uh, you could, if you squint, you could also call them smart contracts, but that term has come to be associated with many things, and some of those things resources are not. Um, <coughs> In particular, resources do not encode imperative execution logic. So smart contracts typically encode like start at state one, do some computation, end at state two, right? Uh, resources don't encode this. Instead, resources encode constraints. So in Anoma, each resource has what we call a logic, where a logic is this kind of predicate function over partial transactions, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, maybe some arguments, um, prefix, suffix, quantity, which is like, uh, like if you have different tokens, it's just for the linear logic balance. So if you have different tokens, you might have one unit of a token, two units of a token. You want to encode fungibility into your base system because it gives you a lot of uh, capabilities and some kind of arbitrary value. So if you want to like squint and think about them as smart contracts, the logic is the code and the value is like the state in the uh, Ethereum system. But we have this built-in way to encode uh, fungibility into the VM and resources don't specify any kind of execution logic. Oops, okay. Um, then uh, the units of the system are kind of the closest thing to an intent, how you might encode an intent, let's say, although it could also contain some side information, is what we call a partial transaction. 
A partial transaction includes two sets of resources. It includes a set of resources which were consumed and a set of uh, new resources which were created. And it includes some like arbitrary extra data, such as signatures. And the idea behind partial transactions is that we can have this kind of <coughs> resource validity check at the partial transaction level. So a partial transaction may not be um, entirely balanced. So we might spend resources that we don't actually have, or we might create resources that aren't yet consumed. But we can check if all of the predicates are satisfied uh, just by mapping over them. Right? Then we can separate out what we call the balance check. So the balance check relies on, you know, maybe you can, th this kind of fungibility of resources question is not so important for the order of execution point. Um, but you could think of there as being different denominations of resources. The denomination of a resource is calculated based on the logic prefix, kind of the static data. And then uh, what we require in order to actually have a transaction be balanced is that there's no change, basically. The sum of the uh, sort of uh, delta of, of all of the created resources less the sum of the delta of all the consumed resources is zero. So this is the like linear logic check if we think about the system in linear logic terms. Um, now this has several nice properties. One is that we kind of uh, partial transactions compose. So if you just take two partial transactions and they're valid and you join their created and consumed resources, you end up with another valid partial transaction. So the system is compositional. Uh, now they might like conflict with each other or something. This has nothing to do with you know, ordering, but the partial transactions themselves compose. Uh, also a transaction, like a valid full transaction is just a partial transaction that in fact happens to be balanced. So there's no sort of hard distinction between intents and transactions anymore. Um, and when you create these partial transactions and compose them and append to them, you can do all of that execution kind of wherever you want. It just needs to end in this valid full transaction which you publish in the blockchain. So you could take, so for example, if you think about the um, uh, specific prisoner's dilemma case, it's almost like you just pretend that you can do some execution which you actually can't do. So you pretend that you're the other player and you create a resource that says that um, your counterparty cooperates um, and you, you know, also, uh, sorry, you consume a resource that says your that your counterparty cooperates and you create a resource that says that you cooperate, which you have the permissions to do. Um, you don't have the permissions to create a resource that says that your counterparty cooperates, but you can consume one that says that your counterparty cooperates, where then this balance check sort of uh, uh, defers the check of the um, uh, like validity of the whole thing to the transaction level instead of the partial transaction level. So symmetric partial transactions, if you create a partial transaction that says that you cooperate and consume a resource that says your, that your counterparty cooperates and your counterparty creates just the inverse, then these will balance because the denominations cancel, cancel out. If you use this for something like a token swap, then you just consume the tokens uh, resource representing the tokens that you already have and want to pay, create a resource of new tokens assigned to you, um, and similarly, symmetric partial transactions will balance, you know, maybe with some slack, that's like an MEV question, which I think is very interesting, but orthogonal to this VM design question, so I'm not going to talk about it. Um, and I will argue that this model addresses these concerns with kind of faithfully translating this uh, conditional commitment uh, concept. Um, in particular, it addresses this kind of like termination and introspection difficulty by just splitting computation from verification. So if we think, if we go back, I think this slide is helpful. If we go back to um, the kind of path in the configuration space of potential state changes that we can make. When you make a partial transaction, you can like make some state changes which you don't even have the permission to do. Like they're far down the line, right? Um, but then you can send that partial transaction to someone else who could make the state changes which if the whole system were sequential would have happened first. But they don't need to happen first anymore because we've made our VM agnostic to the actual ordering of computation. All it needs to care about is that everything checks out okay um, in verification. Uh, then to deal with nominal and structural identities, when we specify interactions on the basis of resources instead of on the basis of like, you know, this one may be simpler, like blockchains kind of already do this, but just to be comprehensive, um, resources already connote the ability to do something because they're owned. So um, inclusion of other players is explicit in this model. If you want, you know, to check that your counterparty kind of cooperates, you just put that check 
right in the like validity check of the partial transaction, right? You consume the resource that says that your counterparty cooperates, and they can only, you know, the whole transaction is only valid if your counterparty in fact sees this and creates the resource that says that they cooperate. Then um, addressing information flow. Um, so this, you know, this is a VM. It's not like a language for information flow. Um, but because validity conditions are separate from the balance check, this helps a lot with building a kind of good substrate for information flow. In particular, it means that you can make the proofs of validity separately and prior to checking the balance. So if I like spend my tokens um, in a partial transaction and the whole thing is unbalanced, but I can go ahead and make the proof for that spend, I can like hide the note where they came from, I can send the partial transaction to you, and you can see what constraints have to be satisfied in order to balance it without seeing the path of execution that allowed me to like create that you know, potential state in the first place. So the validity constraints are, so to speak, are forwarded, and they can kind of be satisfied at any point during execution as long as they're all satisfied at the end. Right, uh, okay, so the spicy take, uh, which I did not offer a like comprehensive mathematical defense of in this talk, but uh, I haven't heard any good counter arguments yet, um, is that this research structure is kind of inevitable, I think. As in that what you really want in order to generalize intents is to build a kind of VM or an execution environment which is agnostic to where execution happened. You don't want it to care about the path. You only want it to care about the end result. Um, you can still use the EVM to do execution. I think that's fine. But I think you would end up with something on top of this that will kind of do this sort of um, intent matching and that will end up splitting out the validity and balance checks in this way. Um, then I argue if you end up with this, then like the EVM does things that maybe you don't need. Like in particular, it does this sequential message passing execution, um, which is fine, but I just don't think it solves the problem that like matching, commi matching conditional commitments wants to solve because it is path dependent and we don't care about the path. Cool, so just the last part here kind of to, to touch upon the first talk um, in going towards a more privacy centric world is how I think this research resource model can act as a substrate for information flow control. So I want to first clarify what I don't mean by substrate for information flow control. There's this great paper called Viaduct by Ralph Recto and some others from Cornell, uh, which I think is a good resource for people trying to think about um, information flow control in a MUB context, blockchain context. And that paper includes a language for information flow control. And this is not a language for information flow control. It's kind of like a runtime. So the way this paper, Viaduct, structures things is that they have a high-level source language that describes, in a pretty declarative way, information flow control policies, like constraints on uh, who is trusted, that is sort of B or not A, include like integrity assumptions and information assumptions. Um, and uh, maybe such a language could include cryptographic assumptions that you're willing to make, other kinds of constraints. Uh, then that language is like compiled somehow into a bunch of instructions which are run using actual cryptographic primitives. And the runtime execution engine is responsible for running the primitives in the correct sequence with real data. Uh, and this is what I, I think the resource model is kind of suitable for, as in it can be a part of, at least, with specific cryptographic primitives, this kind of runtime that executes uh, partial transactions with real data, and you know, if it's constructed correctly, can um, enforce information flow control policies by calling the primitives in the right order, right? So this is not, you know, you could have many different higher level languages which compile and run on something like this. Um, but I think uh, this system is helpful because it is very amenable to what I call the least powerful primitive, and the rule should be in quotes, really. It's not a rule, it's just a heuristic. But um, there's kind of this power ranking of cryptography primitives where you have very powerful primitives that are do everything but are extremely slow and you have very fast primitives that do only one thing, like hash functions, or even slightly in the middle zero-knowledge proofs, but are much faster. And typically, you want to architect your system so that you can use the least powerful primitive you need for the specific task you're trying to do under the specific information flow constraints that you have, because it will make the thing more efficient and faster, uh, and, you know, uh, just amenable to kind of replicated verification in the case of ZKB and stuff like this. So an example of how you would kind of use this runtime uh, this resource logic runtime to provide the kind of information flow control people might want um, is let's say you wanted to do kind of solver selection. Let's say 
you know, in this system, you still have to reveal some information to the solvers in order for them to match uh, your intents or for them to put together partial transactions. But maybe you care about which solvers you send those intents to. Maybe you trust some, maybe they're your friends. And in particular, because we have this separation of validity from balance, once you send, let's say you send your intent to a solver with the instruction like, please find me a counterparty and don't forward it. Don't reveal it to somebody else. Because we have the separation, they can do that. And once they find you a counterparty, they can create another partial transaction, which already kind of has, because it has some execution and makes some proofs, already doesn't reveal any of your personal data anymore. Let's say they take like, you know, you have an A for B trade and they take an A for B trade, a B for C trade, and a C for D trade and make an A for D trade. And maybe under your information flow constraints, this is like a fine amount to reveal because it no longer reveals that not you and not even that there was an A for B trade in the first place. So because we have compositionality, we can get these kind of nice information flow control properties. Um, another example is batching or kind of like if you were to implement something like Penumbra on the resource logic uh, model, how would you do it? Um, you would simply cr consume tokens to create, in this case, threshold encrypted resources, which would be uh, queued in some kind of batch, perhaps a per block batch. Those resources are threshold decrypted next round, next block, um, and they have logic such that the, their logic allows them to only be consumed in this batch. So basically, the validators, you still have to have the validators attest to like what was actually included in the batch, right? They're providing data availability. But the validators attest to what was included in the batch, and the logic checks when all the resources are consumed that the uh, fairness condition, say optimal arbitrage, um, was satisfied. Uh, another thing you might want to do um, is uh, something like aggregate statistics. So in a kind of privacy first world where all of your transactions are private, sometimes you might want information flow control to uh, uh, some decrypt like aggregates that still allow you to reason about um, aggregate properties of user interactions without de-anonymizing specific users. For example, um, if you have a kind of private bridging system, often you might want to be able to reason about economic security, which requires that you know how much of, say, some assets are secured by the proof-of-stake asset of some particular chain. And in order to do that, in a world where the bridges are private, you need to decrypt, like, some aggregate amounts of assets, right? Uh, but let's say you have an information flow control policy that says that, oh, like, this counter of how many assets are on this particular chain will be decrypted, like, every day or something like this, or even every 10 blocks. Um, Resources don't magically solve any of the cryptography problems for you, but they create this nice separation of different parts of state and different parts of logic. And then you can enforce different information flow control policies on those different parts of state. Um, so that's why I think it's kind of like uh, an amenable substrate. Um, right, so uh, kind of in, in summary, the case for the resource model and why I think it might be interesting to you if you're thinking about intents and intent-centric architectures uh, is that resources package data and logic together very cleanly. Uh, they separate out execution so that you don't need to worry about execution paths. You can just worry about results. Um, they make state inclusion very explicit instead of having implicit global state, which is accessed in like some pattern that you don't know. You access only state that you specifically need to validate for the purposes of like your application. Um, and yeah, no path dependence, which is also helpful for information flow control because once you know some variable x, you can like f of x for some other arbitrary functions, you also don't care about this path dependence. Um, conclusion of future directions. Uh, three points, if you only remember three points from this talk, make it these three. One, uh, intent-centric VM design is not a von Neumann problem. We're trying to build something else. Um, it's, it's not you know competing, it's just like orthogonal. Um, two, speculative execution, or this kind of like executing things that you can't in fact authorize yourself but uh, you want to happen as part of a transaction, plus atomicity is a very powerful tool because users care about equilibria, you know, to harken back to the previous talk, users care about the results. And if you kind of translate that philosophy into the design of the VM, users care about the final output state, they care about you know, the game theoretic equilibrium, they don't care about the path it took to get there. In fact, you don't even need to compute the path it took to get there in many cases if you can just you know, find some equilibrium that satisfies all of the constraints. Um, and third, kind of the spiciest, spiciest, perhaps controversial take is that the resource model is probably inevitable. You can call it something else. You can like change, you know, there are some specific decisions about which, uh, you know, variables encode different parts of static or dynamic data. You can change these decisions. But the kind of atomic execution of conditional commitments and the separation out of 
the execution path, so that this can be determined at runtime, I think are things that any intent-centric architecture uh, is really going to want. Some open questions, I think there are also some on the website. Uh, please find me if you're interested in these things. Better formal languages for information flow control, particularly amenable to traditional disclosure. More suitable abstract intermediate representations for programs. Um, solver privacy improvements, maybe particularly using like TEEs in combination with CKPs in efficient ways, I think is interesting. Many more. Uh, you can find me at CWGOS while Twitter lasts. Maybe it will go away soon. I'm also on Blue Sky, but I haven't posted there very much. Uh, but that's only because I'm lazy and I should. Um, or preferably even here. Thank you.